Welcome to the Corporate Treasury 101 podcast. This is the first part of our full interview with Danilo Gonzalez, where we discuss how trade finance works in the energy sector. In the episode of today, expect to learn how does trade finance manifest uniquely in the energy sector, whether there is a difference of treatment between the energy sector and the renewable energy sector, what are the main preoccupations when it comes to doing trade finance in the renewable energy sector, whether banks and financial institutions assess trade finance credit lines differently for the renewable energy sector, considering ESG factors, for instance, and like always, much, much more. Another interview that happened in person and you can find it on YouTube and actually watch Hussam and I interview Danilo, who has been fantastic to us, especially for a first industry focus interview. We hope you will enjoy the episode. If that is the case, and when you're thinking about how you found our podcast, Chances are that it was through word of mouth, social media, or a recommendation from your favorite podcast platform. And this is our only request to you. The best way you can support the podcast is to head to YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Corporate Treasury 101. That will mean the world to us and help more people learn about treasury. On another other note, this episode is brought to you by Automation Boutique. Automation Boutique is empowering treasury, finance, and risk management with tailored automation solution. They use robotic process automation, RPA, AI, APIs, and Power Query to create automations that can work with your existing systems. We partnered with Automation Boutique as we really like their approach to innovation and how they help the industry. For this partnership, they came up with an AI-powered automation self-scan that can help you find out if a business process is suitable for automation and how to best get started. It is totally free, non-intrusive, and only takes about 15 minutes. What's great is that the report you will get from the scan helps you determine if the benefits of the automation outweigh the costs. If you want to have a look, head to the link in the description or to automationboutique.com slash corporate treasury 101. And with all that being said, please welcome Danilo Gonzalez. Danilo, thank you so much for coming on the Corporate Treasury 101 podcast. Thank you for having me. Not at all. So we're going to jump into um, some more advanced versions of trade uh, trade finance. So could you start off by just explaining to us again and reminding everyone what trade finance is? Sure, why not? Um, trade finance is a group of strategies or financial solutions that helps um, to mitigate the risk when we perform trade, for example, uh, you can imagine that you want to sell uh, a product abroad and then of course you will need a buyer and trade finance help us to um, resolve the divergences, you know, any kind of risk that might, might appear from the supplier side or um, the customer side, let's put it this way. And that's the main purpose of trade finance is to eliminate the risk? It's to mitigate the risk and to enable the the trading, right. no? Uh, basically, you can put um, introduce a third party, which is could be a bank. This bank will assist in handling the risk inherent inherent risk that you will face when you do when you do trade, right? Uh, basically, you can use trade finance for different purposes, like um, uh, improve your cash flow, for example. You can do sales of receivables as well. So. Supply chain finance is also considered kind of a trade finance instrument. Interesting. Um, but also, for example, you can, it's not a traditional financing because you can use trade finance um, to cover, for example, um, currency risk. Uh, you can cover political instability, no? in non payments possibilities, or maybe a credit worthiness of uh, one of the parties involved. Okay. So I thought, so trade finance will allow you to do trade internationally, right? So you want to sell, you're a European company, you want to sell something to a US company, you're not sure they will pay you. So I put in place a contract with a third party that say, hey, I'm guaranteeing this trade. So in exchange of a fee, obviously, if this deal doesn't go well, I will pay you back exactly. part of it or something. Yeah, like that. this covers the payment or the receivable for the exporters, oh, right? And uh, 
and the importer can get an extended credit in in order to fulfill the the trade order. Okay. And so, how do you enhance cash flow with trade finance? I'm interested into understanding that part because you will receive an advance of cash as well. It depends on the the instrument. So, for instance, uh, the most common is warranties, and then you can have many types of warranties. Like, for example, bid bonds for when you apply for a new project. Mm -hmm. um, you have uh, advance payment warranties. So, you need to offer 100% of the advance that you receive in terms in in a warranty. So it has a value, the warranty has a value, maximum value. Then you can have a performance warranty, you can have a warrant warranty, depends on what you are covering and in which part of the project you are, mm. right? So it, it, it will depend, but then you can have also a letter of credits, but the difference is that in a letter of credit, you will pay with a letter of credit. So it's, okay. it's, uh, it's gonna be executed. So a warranty is like a check, I give you the check, and if I don't pay you, you can go to the bank and execute the check. In this case, uh, the warranties are at least not almost never executed. Uh -huh. If everything runs well, there is no need to execute any warranty. So it's a risk prevention instrument, the guarantee, whereas the letter of credit, you will just say, okay, I will pay you, but at a later stage or when you deliver something. When, in the when the documentation is completed, uh, then the letter of credit will be released uh, with the issuing bank. Mm -hmm. yes super clear so it's the other way around it will almost always get issued it, it is on. the purpose the purpose is that the issuing banks take the risk from the from the class from the customer so like this the seller makes sure that it's going to receive the money with the proper documentation so it's not anymore on the client side is the risk is on the bank side at this certain at certain point so that's important i guess because trust isn't always yeah it's a, available it's a strangers trading mm -hmm. right so it's, <laughs> there is an inherent risk when you are trading with somebody that you don't know uh, you don't know if the shipment is gonna is gonna take place uh the vendor say like if i say my shipment i don't know if the customers will pick it up mm -hmm. um so there is risk on the supply and also on the customer side both sides so banks or institutions go in the middle to allow the trade uh, run smoothly right mitigating the risk in both sides but there is risk in both sides the buyer and the seller so this is the the key play that uh, banks or insurance companies can also play uh, what how does the bank price that is it a percentage of the the amount is it a fixed fee typically how do banks price that for example for warranties normally what you get is a credit line okay so Let's mind you say, um, let's get a, I will negotiate 100 million line, credit line for warranties with bank ABC. So the bank will say, okay, uh, for this line, I will charge you, for example, for warranties until one year, three basis points, let's mind. And then uh, from one year to three, another price for three to five, and then unlimited another, because unlimited represent more risk. It's going to be more expensive. And it's going to be a percentage of the of the amount. Yes. And then, from what I remember from my old banking days, you would also charge per guarantee for the issuance. There would be a small there would fee. be a small fee for closing. issuance, modifications. Exactly. Uh, depends on your negotiations. It could be for free. Mm -hmm. uh, this issuance price. I mean, if they are getting a percentage for the warranty itself, right. I, in my opinion, it's easy money because then the risk, if you never execute. They get a lot of a lot of commissions, mm -hmm. and it's um, I won't say low risk, but it's um, it, it is it, it's there is there are not many cases when you execute the yeah. banks win. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. a good life lesson. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So to the so to the trust point, does it mean that once you have a well established relationship with a, a client or a supplier overseas, you will not put in place any trade finance instrument anymore, or will you still? Because there is an inherent risk, as you said, I don't know if you I think there will, or this kind of stuff. I think there will be always, because if you, I mean, by reading some, some books, you will see that 80% of trade mm -hmm. use a form of trade finance. So it's a lot. So of course, building trust is, it, you can avoid this if you are, have a long relationship with, uh, with this customer or vendor. But I think it could be an internal policy. Like uh, my process says that I need to request this and that. So 
normally when what we focus mostly is on the on the outbound so in which me as a supplier offer a warranty to my client because this is where the risk lays mostly but there is also the inbound in which i am the client i am going to ask my supplier um, a warranty both need to be handled but there is a bigger focus on the outbound because there is a reputational risk there is a, of course a non the non-payment risk and so on um, the execution part that then goes to legal so it, this is why outbound has more focus i will say so as a supplier you want to make sure your client will ultimately pay you and as a client you want to make sure your supplier will deliver the goods that he they or they promised has the difference between the performance guarantee and the bid guarantee and the difference exactly so can we deep dive a little bit more into the different instruments that are used in trefan so you yep. name a few of them letters of credit guarantees what else is out there those are the two most common but then uh then uh everything is driven by the cash flows not in 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 terms of trade finance, you have commercial cash flows involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not like traditional uh, financing, but there are other instruments that are also uh, considered part of trade finance, like uh, um, revolving uh, sales of receivables, for example, um, or uh, bright export finance as well, because everything goes at the same at the same time. It can be all these products at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, depends on the needs. Know, how big the project is, what are the needs of the customer, uh, and also this will boost the revenues of the of the customer. In this case, maybe a customer, let's imagine that the customer has no capacity to issue a thousand pieces of something, and then uh, then you say, okay, I'm gonna get a credit for that, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna deliver what is requested. But without a kind of export finance, it won't be happen. It won't be possible. Right, so it's uh, this also helps to helps the revenue. If you have hardship uh, uh, financial problems, it's gonna help because uh, you you can uh, use some some kind of uh, credit in revolving facilities, for example. Yeah. So, but so why would the third party, if you're in financial difficulties, why would the third party come and guarantee a potential trade? What's in it? Because the risk is higher. Or do they then price it? higher as well so that's that's why they would do it why do we need a third party i mean it's basically because uh you need to have a another let's say another institution backing you mm -hmm. uh backing your business but so why would they take the risk when the when the third so not the third party but one of the party in the supplier or the client part is in financial difficulties that could be offset by a trade finance instrument what is it? It's more expensive, or why would the party do that? Uh, why? Because uh, um, they want to help you, and then then you show some numbers, like saying that I am going to uh, business. cash in with this and that, and then I will repay you. Or they can put some assets on as collateral as well. Okay. Normally, this is the case. But uh, normally, when you um, negotiate a credit line, you try not to put collateral because okay. uh, otherwise the the purpose is different. It's, it's normally you say, okay, this, these are my numbers, my financial statements, how much I'm going to get for you, one, 100 million, 200 million line, and then you have to use until this capacity mm. is, fully, is fully completed. So trade finance credit lines by nature don't have a collateral because that will uh, not serve the purpose and actually go the opposite way. Yeah, because if you put a collateral, why then I need a line? Exactly. <laughs> I will give the, I will put the cash collateral, uh, and then uh, and and then I will use my own cash, my own assets uh, to cover the the risk. I don't know if this is a stupid thing to say, but is the trade itself not like a collateral? Like there is a underlying trade to the yeah, but banks can banks can ask yeah. collateral. Yeah, I absolutely. mean, if they don't, if they they think that you are that you don't have enough um, assets or that you are risky, a risky customer, they could ask a collateral. And then for this, you can, for example, issue a global area of support in which your parent company will back you up. Right. The different subsidiaries, let's put it this way. I think we've, we've touched upon it quickly, but maybe to, to close this overview and refresher of what trade finance is, why, uh, why is trade finance crucial for business, especially the ones that operate at global scale um well actually 
it's it's crucial because as as I mentioned, there there is a eighty percent of the international trade use a form of trade finance. Mm-hmm. So you are going to um, you need a you need this third party to intervene in order to let's say to mitigate the risk and um, agree on the divergences. No? Yeah. Uh, customers want something, uh, the supplier needs something else, and then there is a meeting point. Let's put it this way. Uh, in which everybody agrees on something, mm. and this is the document that will that will play a role yeah. in order to otherwise the trade probably will not happen. Mm. So to uh, to enable trust to basically. enable the trade, yeah. yeah, makes a lot of sense. 